You know, it's a time of year where, well, let me just show you. It's fall season, and that means one thing, we gotta brew our stout. But first, let's go riding. to go biking with me when filming? I would say medium fun. <laughs> medium fun? Yeah. yeah. Deck of is it fun? Yeah, it's fun. And we're back to the brewery. So, you can see that things are still a bit under construction. And today is a brew day. But first we need to finish up the construction, which is installing a sink. My neighbor is super nice and an excellent plumber and helping me install this brand new stainless steel piping. But I also need to install this ventilation. I'm changing it from being uninsulated to insulate it with a check valve because air was going in and out when it was off. Normally I would do a B-roll sequence for you guys to show us wrapping up and cleaning up. However, I'll spare you and instead subscribe below if you would like to see actually what we've installed and when the brewery is all finished. With that, let's just skip to the good part. For this brew, I use the Great Divide Yeti from Colorado, which is where I'm from, as the inspiration. The first thing we did was modify our water profile to be the Dublin profile found in Brewfather. This is great for stouts and dark ales. For the fermentables, we used 20 kilograms of pale ale malt, 1.5 kilograms of caramel malt 120, 1.5 kilograms of flaked wheat, 1 kilogram of black malt, 1 kilogram of chocolate malt, and 1 kilogram of roasted barley. The key to these beers is have as much combination of roasted malts as possible in order to add to the complexity of the final beer. In addition to those fermentables, I also added one kilogram of acidulated malt to lower the pH, as well as three kilograms of dextrose. The reason I added dextrose to this beer is I wanted to bump up the alcohol, but also have it finish drier. After mashing for 75 minutes to get as much sugar as possible, we sparge at 75 degrees C and start heating to a boil. For the hops, I use Centennial all the way with 125 grams at 60 minutes, 75 grams at 30 minutes, 50 grams at 15 minutes to boil, and 50 grams with five minutes left in boil. Oh yeah, and make sure you have something inspiring to drink while brewing. Here I thought it was fitting to drink another Imperial Stout. So after that, I oxygenate the beer and then cool it down and send it to the fermenter. So one way to increase your brew house efficiency is to have more of your actual liquid that goes into your fermenter. And a cool way that I've seen people do, so I didn't invent this, but you can actually push out all of the liquid that goes out of your, out through your chiller and into your fermenter, you can push it out here with CO2. So the first thing you do is you hook up your CO2 and then we are going to then close off our tank and then slowly open our CO2 regulator. And then you'll see that it will push out through the... Yeah.
That squeaking sound is because I have a one-way valve, a check valve. Bye bye beer. And then I close this, I, I always close the return valve that's coming in because you'll see that it doesn't really have a pressure to get some of this. So then I make sure that my return valve or my out valve from the pump is closed so that way this won't spill out the bottom. And that's the story about life. Tune in next week for more shit. Yay. <laughs> Yay. It's important to pitch a very big yeast starter because she's hungry. I think someone's just unfollowed us. <laughs> hey! Tweet. Nice. This is for the cover. <laughs> so next, we're gonna add our beautiful oak chips. And what I've done is I've actually soaked them inside whiskey in order to sanitize them, but also draw out some flavor into the whiskey. Next, I'm going to strain my oak chips. If I can get them out. You should smell that. It's amazing. While I don't plan to add the whiskey, be sure to keep that because I have something in store for that later. Next, we add it to our beer. I like to keep this butterfly valve on all times, even if I'm not doing pressure dry hopping. And the reason is sometimes during fermentation, you realize, oh, it'd be really nice to add something like um, more vanilla flavor or, or more oak or something, but you've already started carbonating it. When you have this on here, then you're able to add it to the carbonated fermenter instead of having to drain the pressure every time. And I've learned that mistake a few times. I recommend if you have the top butterfly valve that no matter what, you just have it installed and you can even cap it with just a normal cap that it probably comes with. And then that way you have the option later on to add things. So gonna sanitize it. The hard part is always opening it. <laughs> My plan is to let these sit for at least a week, but I'll basically be doing tastings along the way. And you can see some of the whiskey is still attached with these. Close it on up and then we wait. I'm waiting till the main fermentation done is, or we've approximately reached our final gravity. So the way I've been able to determine that is I've been actually sampling the gravity as I've been going because I forgot to uh, calibrate the tilt properly. So it's not really giving me accurate results. So what I've done is I've, after about three days, started measuring the gravity, just taking little samples and measuring it on my easy dents and then plotting that. And once you see it start leveling out, that's when I like to add the whiskey chips. And by whiskey chips, I mean whiskey soap oak cubes. But remember not to throw away the whiskey that you've collected because ah, we have plans for this. Ah, it smells so good. It's like a bit vanilla, kind of oaky smell. It doesn't even really smell that strongly of like harsh whiskey. This is uh, Jack Daniels, by the way. Ooh, still burns though. <laughs> now with that precious whiskey we save, we are going to infuse it with vanilla. In fact, it's called bourbon vanilla. Look at that, and we're using bourbon whiskey. A match made in heaven. I'm gonna use two vanilla sticks for my 60 liter batch. The idea here is that I'd like to infuse the vanilla flavor into some of the whiskey, which already has some oak flavor. And then I will dump in this whiskey 
vanilla infusion inside the fermenter near the end. I want to reduce the contact time of the vanilla because it can, I don't want it to be too strong. So first thing I'm gonna do is cut this baby down the middle. You can see here we have all of the delicious goodies. The vanilla caviar as it's called. And I'm going to scrape that out with a spoon and put it inside the jar where my whiskey will go. Next, I'm going to chop it up into smaller pieces to increase the contact time with the whiskey and then cover it with just enough whiskey to submerge all of the vanilla. You can see that I added approximately 50 milliliters of the whiskey to our vanilla. It already smells damn ridiculous. So next I'll let this sit for about a week and then pour it into fer the fermenter. So see you in a week. So my plan is to do the kegging in two steps. First, I am going to do two kegs for the nitro kegs. The reason I'm gonna do this separately than the canning is that I actually don't want the carbonation of my nitro kegs to be very high. So you can see right now I have them um, barely carbonated. So they just got a bit of bubbles, but that way if I add the nitro, it won't just be a foamy mess. After I carbonate the kegs, my plan is then to bump up the carbonation in my handy dandy tank here and then can the rest. So first, we need to clean some kegs. I'm actually using the sink as the holder for my keg cleaner here. Works pretty well. All right, first I'm going to do a taste test and also kind of check the carbonation. You'll notice here that I'm actually not using this coil valve because I'm not expecting it to be super carbonated. I want it, as I said, just just a bit of carbonation that will complement the, the nitro. Check that baby out. Next, it's time to dump the yeast before kicking. So you can see there, it was hard to open it slowly, so I opened it a bit fast, which I think I punched a hole through the cone, because you can see, still have some yeast sediment. So it could definitely could have done that better. Now time to install our sanitized filter. Connect the CO2, purge. I also like to purge a beer line with the CO2 that's filled in here. Then do one more purge. And now we have sanitized and CO2 purge filter and tape. Now we grab our cake, fill with beer. Purge out the space, tear out our scale for our purged cake with a spunding valve on it. And also important, make sure that you have the beer line already attached so that way it's accounted for in the weight. Snap on the beer line. So what happened there is that I, <laughs> I had my pressure of my keg be higher than the pressure of my tank. So then as soon as I connected it, it wanted to vent to the tank. Next time I will make sure I have it closed to the tank when I do this process. <laughs> Take two, make sure that the pressure of your keg is slightly lower than the pressure of your fermenter. Now we can transfer. Open up the butterfly valve to your fermenter. 
You can see right now it's slightly filling, but barely. That's because the pressure is almost the same inside, inside my keg. So the next step is we open our spunding valve a bit, which releases some pressure inside our keg and therefore allowing more beer to flow. Just open it up a bit and you can see we're filling. Also make sure to connect a CO2 tank to your gas inlet in order to make sure that you're maintaining the pressure that you need or else CO2 will start coming out of solution. I'm looking to fill to 18 liters, which is a little over 18 kilograms. If you want to be exact, you can just multiply your final density or your final gravity, which is the ratio of its, of its gravity to water, to the actual amount you want to fill. These kegs almost have exactly 18 liters. Once you reach your desired volume, close your butterfly valve and you're done. So now I want to increase the pressure for the beers that I'm going to can because I don't know if canning nitro will work, but I'll experiment with that in the future. So let's uh, increase this pressure. I'll get back to putting the beers on nitro in a sec, but after that I can the beers and I did that using my duo filler and cannular, which works really great. And I'll actually do a video on this in the future. So make sure to subscribe and also let me know if you have any questions along the way. So let's get to what you've been waiting for. So nitro is actually a bit tricky to get here in Norway. I had to order it from a gas distributor. The mix that I ended up going with was 20% CO2 and then the rest nitrogen. But holy shit, did it turn out good. Overall, this beer came out pretty good. I'm quite happy with it. In the beginning, it was a bit harsh with the hops, so I was a bit worried that it's a bit too much bittering hops. But over time, I've let this sit in the keg for about two weeks or so on nitro, and it's really mellowed out. It could use a bit more vanilla flavor, so next time, I think I'll add more of the vanilla or more vanilla beans, in fact. I recommend trying this brew yourself. So if you're interested in seeing another brew on this system, just uh, click right here. And uh, if you're interested in a bit more in the future and more brews and watching this brewery grow, be sure to subscribe. But otherwise, uh, I'll see you when I see you. So cheers.